Hello, everybody. We just had a lovely chat with Kate Speak, founder of Showreel Share Day. Uh, we spoke about all things from horror films to casting right the way through to showreel advice. Yeah, we also went quite in depth into indie films. So anyone that's looking to get into the independent film world, where there is an actor or creative of any sorts, there's tons of info in today's episode. And Kate's done some fantastic work as an actor. So do check her out. But if you're already aware of Kate's work and you've just um, stumbled upon our little podcast, hello, we are Matt and Christian. We run In The Room. We talk to actors, directors, casting directors, producers, anyone and everyone in this industry to try and work out how to answer the question how do we get in the room so if you like today's podcast please do follow us on social media we're on twitter we're on instagram uh, i think it's at itr in the room so follow us like our stuff talk to us we're pretty decent people at the end of the day at least i am christian i don't know maybe not so much what do you think about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you're probably right there <laughs> but <laughs> no i'm do. lovely you can message me too <laughs> don't message him anyway <laughs> we really hope you enjoy this episode and um, have some fun in the room with us this is itr with kate speak Hello, Kate. How are you doing today? Hi, guys. I'm very well, thank you. And I'm just really delighted to be invited onto your show. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on, Kate. We've wanted to talk to you since um, Show Real Share Day in uh January uh, no it was March of this year I think it was wasn't it and um yeah. we jumped we jumped in on that trend I remember dropping you a message <laughs> to say that we really wanted to get involved and give people some feedback on reels and you kindly retweeted us and let us really get stuck in with some brilliant work for actors and that really um helped us gain a bit of a twitter following at the start of this year which was a massive help to us and oh, now you come good. to talk that's to us great. as well so um Lovely. it's an absolute joy to have you on um and we like to start our podcast by talking about our guests journey into their work so we'd love to just start off with asking you how did you get into acting and was there a standout moment or memory you have when you realized it's what you wanted to do for a living sure thing okay well, thanks for the question um yeah, so I didn't always want to be an actor. It wasn't one of those things where I wanted it when I was a, a young child, but I was always quite playful, loved a bit of make-believe, loved kind of telling the other kids what to play in the playground. So I guess that was always kind of like a little bit of an element about what I was like as a younger child. But um, I was actually more into um, art and design and drawing cartoons. Um, that was kind of my creative outlet um, throughout most of my, uh, my upbringing, really through primary, secondary school. Um, so when I went on to college, I was actually studying A-level art and design graphics and English language, which I enjoyed. But you know what? Their industry is just as hard to get into as the acting world. So I really struggled a little bit in the art world. Um, it, it was a big passion for me and I was slogging away at it and trying very hard to get into different um, art and design universities. But whilst I was at college, I um, I hooked up with a, a friend of mine Lisa who was um who was auditioning at the time for a college production of West Side Story and uh she just kind of dragged me along to an audition and for a bit of uh um moral support I suppose and I thought I'd go along because I'm not against the idea of performing but I thought I'd just tag along as a mate kind of thing and uh whilst I was there they um they asked me if I wanted to audition as well so I did um I can't remember exactly what I was asked to do for the audition but it probably involved a bit of dance a bit of singing and some acting um, didn't give it much thought. And then lo and behold, I was actually offered the role of Anita, which is a really cool oh, wow. part to play in West Side yeah. Story. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, as soon as I was offered it, I, I, was, I was keen to give it a whirl. And um, yeah, I think, I, I guess we probably only performed it for about a month or so. Sorry, not a month. I told you, I told you I had a head like a sieve at the start of this. It would have been about a week. It was just a college show. Um, but anyway, a run, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really, really loved it. Um, and uh, I was going through this weird crossroads, like I said, with trying really hard to get into art university. And one of the um, one of the college lecturers sort of stopped me in the hallway one day. She's like, you are Anita in West Side Story. I was like, yeah. 
She's like, I really hope you're doing drama here. I was like, no, I'm not. Um, I'm actually trying to figure my life out at the moment. She said, well, look, why don't you really look into doing a bit more of this? Um, and I actually then, instead of going off to do university at art, I looked at other colleges. So the same kind of level I was already studying at, but a completely different direction. I looked for performing arts courses. Um, and then I went on to do um, a BTEC performing arts course, um, which then led me to falling in love a little bit more with the movement side of it. I did a lot of... Um, uh, uh, sort of musical theatre. I uh, then went on to H and D musical theatre. Then fell in love with acting, and then decided to stay on and do a lot more drama. Um, did uh, it, it was great actually because our, our our group was really small at the college I was studying at. So we got a lot of really sort of um, good one to one um, guidance on on the art of acting. And uh, I just remember literally falling in love with it and thinking this is actually what I'm meant to be doing. I just got a feeling from it that I never really got from anything that I enjoyed doing creatively before. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there was um, a sort of open audition at the college I was at, uh, just as I was getting to the end of my HND for a musical theatre show called Something's Foot. And um, I auditioned for that. And uh, the theatre company came to audition us and, and I was offered a role in that. So pretty much as soon as I finished studying, I then went off to do a tour for um, three months like, throughout the Christmas season. It wasn't a panto, but it had that kind of panto vibe, mm -hmm. um, performing all throughout Christmas, meeting some really cool people, living together. Um, we were touring throughout most of the Southwest, um, literally you know, performing on Boxing Day and stuff. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And I just remember thinking, like, now that I've had a taste of this, I don't want it to go away. Like, I want to keep doing this thing. Um, but as you guys must know as well, you know, acting work isn't, you, you don't just come out of one job and go straight into another. So you've got to kind of fill the gaps in. Um, so I actually went back to work at the college that I'd been studying at. Um, I was a support worker, but I worked in the performing arts department. Um, I was helping children with learning difficulties, but I was helping them to learn to act and to perform. Um, and during that time, I think it was really cool because it just kind of kept my head in the game, really. I got, I still had that kind of acting bug, but that, you know, I was just kind of working alongside it. And um, after doing that for the best part of maybe about eight years or so, I just really wanted to get out and do it again for myself. Um, maybe a little bit selfishly, I don't know, but I was in a weird crossroad in my life where I was like, I just want to go out and do something again. Um, so I, I auditioned for a company called the English Theatre Company, which is a touring theatre company based in Sitges near Barcelona. And uh, we were kind of rooted there, did all our rehearsals there and um, did uh, with them two years uh, of work, another company similar, uh, a year of work. So pretty much worked throughout Europe in theatre for three years, uh, give or take the, the school holidays and, and that. Um, and then when I'd finished all that, I'd had a great time, you know, we're doing three or four shows a day, every day. Uh, it was really tiring, but absolutely brilliant at that point in my life. Um, but I felt like I'd kind of really had my fill of theatre at the time because I had been doing it so much. So when I came back to the UK, um, I settled down with my partner, Steve, who I actually met in the theatre company that I've been working in. And uh, I decided to start to have a little look at other aspects of the industry. And that's when I traversed into doing um, a bit more kind of independent film, screen work, and just kind of studying alongside that as well to learn a little bit more about what made that different to theatre work. And then again, mm -hmm. fell in love with that as well, if not more, because I found a style of acting that really kind of clicked with me. Um, totally different to theatre, but I really loved it. And from there on, I haven't really looked back. You know, I've taken little breaks here and there where I've had to with life, um, but it's something that uh, has become a huge part of my life. And I've really enjoyed the people that I've met along the way um, and just the whole grind really, whether it's been um, busy or not so busy, I've just enjoyed being part of, being part of it and even, you know, even the fact that you guys have interviewed me tonight, the fact that I get to talk about it, you know, it's a big part of my life. And, and I'm glad that I made that decision, really. Wow, that's such a such an interesting story. Um, That must have been so rewarding working with kids with learning, learning difficulties. And yeah. I wanted to ask a bit about the, uh, I know you did two years with the English um, touring theatre company yeah. and, and, and all them experiences you had. Is there anything that you learn or a piece of advice that you got given that you still use on projects when you're casting and things like that to this day? Uh, with, with regards to actually acting or getting into the projects in the first place? Just, just in everything, I suppose. Is there anything that really stand out or a piece of advice that you use from day to day or when you're working creatively? 
I think it's just about always being ready to learn things from people. Um, obviously, learn from your director, learn from the people that are holding everything together. Don't ever assume you know everything about everything. Um, it's really important to always keep a clear head when it comes to that. Um, it'll make you a better actor and it'll make you a better person to employ generally. Um, and just to kind of remind yourself that although it's absolute tons of fun, you know, we all love it. It's, it's, uh, it's the kind of job you literally do fall in love with. Um, you have to remember that you do still have to be professional. You do have to work hard and you do have to treat everyone with respect. Um, you know, always show up on time, always make sure you know your lines to the best of your ability. Um, and and just to kind of, I suppose another thing that, that that is a big deal for me is health and wellness and fitness and stuff. So I think just kind of keeping yourself on your A game as often as you can so that when you are given a job or when you're working on a job, you know, you're, you've got the energy, you've got the, you've got the, um, even the brain capacity to kind of like retain the amount of lines you're learning and, and still sort of show up with a smile on your face and stuff. So I guess to summarize everything that I've just spouted out, be professional and keep enjoying it and keep asking questions. Amazing. Lovely. Yeah. Um, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions on independent film because it's it's been quite a huge part of your career as as a creative. And, you know, the world of independent film is is vast. There's tens of thousands of projects a year in every genre imaginable. Um, so we'd like to ask a few questions on this side of the industry to make it more accessible to those who don't know much about it and more Definitely, successful yeah. for those who do but might not have gained much traction yet. So um, firstly, um, as an actor, how do you recommend mm -hmm. people go about networking and getting on the radar of indie film companies, producers, directors and the like? I think that first and foremost, just, you know, for everyone to just kind of just. Obviously, you, you know where you want to end up. We all have a kind of game plan where we want to be in the industry or whatnot. But we have to remember that if you're going into the independent world, your you're, world, you're almost kind of starting from scratch. So I think it's really important respectfully to learn which indie filmmakers you really want to work with and if you want to work with them watch their work you know realize where they're coming from why they make the genre that they do why they make the style of genre that they do um go and watch their films you know go attend a screening go and talk to them if you can you know it's not easy for everyone and i'm based in the sticks i feel like i'm in the sticks anyway being based in bristol but you know we don't <sighs> meet these people very often but you have to kind of step up and go out of your way to you know, go to Fright Fest or, or, you know, go to these different events and, and just introduce yourself to them. Um, specifically for me, uh, a filmmaker that I, I will always praise to the end of my days is a guy called Charlie Steeds. He's a close friend of mine, um, but I met him professionally. I actually um, auditioned for one of his castings that was advertised. Um, gosh, it would have been about 2012, something like that, uh, on Casting Call Pro, which I I think it's called Mandy or vice versa. I can't remember which one that is now. Um, and because I loved the concept of his film, I wasn't thinking, oh, how well is this paid? You know, how big is my role going to be? I was like, this film sounds brilliant. Um, it was called Labyrinthia and it was like an underground Mad Max type thing. All these people were living in this like really grubby um, dystopian underground universe. And uh, the character that I was auditioning for was very much like a Sarah Connor type character. She was a mother. She was feisty. She had strength. She was sort of ex-military, all these kind of things that I absolutely love. Um, and I pretty much approached the filmmaker with that. Um, and I auditioned and I was very gratefully, I, I got the role and I loved working on it. And it was the most uncomfortable shoot just for all of us, cast and crew. You know, we were literally working in this tiny little like farm that had been converted into a tunnel system. So we were like bent over all day, like hurting our backs and that. But I just loved all of it. I didn't mind if it was a late night shoot or, you know, I'm scared of spiders. There were spiders everywhere. Um, it just You just got to kind of muck in and do it. But because I had such a good kind of rapport with Charlie, not just um, as a friend, but I totally respected his vision as well. We started talking about work whilst we were on that set and discussing ideas, um, you know, because we're all creatives. We have ideas as well. And you don't always want to step out of uh, out of line, really. But, you know, I was like, you clearly like horror action. I clearly like horror action. This kind of setting is very uh, similar to a kind of... Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre type vibe, you know. So we just started having a, a bit of a giggle about that. And then lo and behold, he wrote his next feature film, which was a bigger step up, um, a higher budget. And because we'd had that conversation and we'd made ourselves known to each other, he then cast me in that. And Charlie's very influenced by um, uh, people who 
basically create a kind of film family. So, um, you know, like with the American Horror Story, they have pretty much mm-hmm. the same actors back each time playing different roles, that kind of thing. So he, he explained quite clearly then that that was his vision as a filmmaker. And I was like, well, I want to be part of your film family. This sounds great. And um, I won't bore you with all the details, but, you know, over the next, almost the next decade, really, we just kept bouncing ideas. And either I worked with him or uh, my my newborn baby worked in one of his films. Um Oh, I'd just like to hear about what he was up to and promote his work wherever possible. Um, so reining myself back into your original question, really, it's about meeting these filmmakers, but also remember that you can help people as well. Like, it's not just about take, take, take. How can I work on your film? It's like, if we work together, how can I put your name on the radar as well? Um, you know, let's literally collaborate. And I've always found that, you know, the more you collaborate and team up with people, the more it pays you off and them off at the same time totally equal measure and um 99 of projects that i've worked on have been that kind of rapport where it's like we're working together but we're really rooting for each other as well and and they'll help you back as well so just you know make make friends in the industry really Mm. actors coaching international are offering 20 percent discount on their acting classes for in the room listeners Go to actorscoachinginternational.com and put inroom20 in the discount code or email hello at actorsci.com. Yeah, it's totally about building those personal relationships, I think. And um, that has to come from somewhere. And it's getting that first step right that is often so difficult for people. I mean, uh, through this platform, Christian and I are actually making more personal connections with brilliant people in the industry than we ever did as just actors emailing. We found a way to start literally talking to people, which is great. And it it really makes what we do um, even more fun. And it's also great to hear that your newborn baby has got more feature film credits than I have this year. That's that's absolutely fabulous. (laughs) (laughs) Um, he he got cut from one if it makes you feel any better he was awful in one of them so they got rid of him (laughs) Um, second uh, second question on uh, indie film what are any uh, major misconceptions that you've heard about independent film from from any stage of the creative process because like anyone that is um, really in the know in a certain part of our industry you hear people talking about it and you go "Mm, actually that's not right. Or do people pretty much get it spot on with indie film? I think uh, one of the biggest misconceptions is, is is lumping all independent film into the same like bracket. You know, they're so vastly different. Um, and also don't, you know, don't dismiss a film because of its budget. So many people sort of get all very uh, uppity about the budget of a film. They ask too many questions about the budget. And it's like, you know, what? if you want to be a creative, just forget the budget. It's none of your business. You're just here to act. You're here to be creative. Um, get on and do it. You know, I know a lot of us want really decent material for our show reels or or what have you. But essentially, if you remember why we're actors in the first place, it's because there's characters we want to bring to life. And I think we really just need to get involved in stuff. And you are going to make some rubbish projects and you're going to make some brilliant projects. And it really doesn't matter as long as you have a good time whilst you're doing it. And I do think specifically genre wise, there's massive misconceptions about, um, for example, well, the horror world, because, um, yeah, they are possibly one of the easier things to shoot on a lower budget so people have this sort of idea that it's just going to be really hammy and um it's just going to be gore and stuff they kind of forget that within all that if you're working with the right people and if you're doing your job you still want to be playing a dramatic role you still want to be bringing a believable character into the screen um so it's just, I guess people don't don't write off projects because they're independent, because most of the greatest films ever are independent. I mean, again, on the horror vibe, Halloween was an independent film. You know, I think any in Hollywood, anything under 30 million is classified as like a low budget movie. So, you know, I just think people should just be open to trying stuff out and, and also use it as a, a play space to, to get good at something. Um, just keep doing it, really. But I think, and you know, if you sort of went, day one in the industry straight into a very high-end tv job um in all honesty you'd be really pleased but you'd be terrified as well and i think you need to kind of go up through the ranks um of independent the independent film world to figure out what kind of actor you are um especially with with screen acting being so drastically different from theater acting so yeah so just people just don't write off indie film give it a try and and meet different filmmakers again because some of them are so much better with what they're doing than others you know and you don't know till you get out there and meet them and and try working with them totally that that, um, what you said towards the start of that answer reminded me of a Christopher Lee quote I'm gonna um, add a little bit where he said something about um, you know all actors have to make bad films now and again just don't be bad in them 
I think it's something like yeah, that. Exactly. That's, that's, that's <laughs> a great quote is that, you know, there's still, you know, major motion pictures that are panned by critics, but people go, well, that actor was fantastic. And um, you know, as, <laughs> yeah. as you say, you're always rolling the dice when when you go out and make something yeah. independent, whether that's film or theatre. Um, one more question yeah. on, on, on indie film that, um, as you say, there's so many different types, so many films, so many directors, companies. It's such a saturated space um how do you think projects should operate to best get noticed both at the stage of you know requiring funding and then when the film is completed getting it seen and spoken about i think they have uh, i definitely think they have their work cut out for them and i appreciate that and i think i think the best way to approach it really is to um get people to uh to just get behind you, you know show them show them what their support and their money means you know, if someone's setting up a crowdfunder, um, you know, really, really remember what you're actually doing. You're asking people that probably don't have a lot of money to support you, um, which is a big ask. So give them something back, you know, whether or not it's even just the perks of their um, of their crowdfunding, you know, give them something that they would go out and buy from the shop, like a really cool T-shirt or something, you know, for their money. So they're buying into something and they'll get behind you. And I think if people just if they just like how you come across or they respect that, you know, you might not hit your targets, but you're really trying. Uh, maybe you you show uh, lots of examples of your previous work or, you know, camera tests or CG tests or any of the stuff you're trying to put together in order to build this um, concept of a film. Uh, I think you're on to win it. I think you just got to be careful not to be arrogant. You know, don't assume people need to support your project. There are billions and billions of filmmakers out there that want to get their stuff seen. And other people do it really well. I mean, there's a um, there's an actor out there. Um, hopefully you guys have heard of his name. It's Mark Zamet. He's a really lovely guy. Yes. Um, he's, he did uh, Homeless he's Ashes, wasn't he? Was exactly. It home- he did Ashes, Homeless yeah. Ashes and um, it did fantastically well. And he had an idea and he just kept, powering through with the idea and he brought people onto his team that are really respected in the industry and um I don't know if that I can't remember if that was crowdfunded so forgive me if I'm wrong but he's you know he's built up a reputation via Homeless Ashes and obviously because of the the nature of the film as well you know it's an important message um he's got a fan base now and now that he has a fan base he can use that with his other projects and I, I it sounds like he's doing really well with the other stuff that he's doing ongoing but more than anything he's a nice guy and um i'll tell you right now like there are times when uh mark would call me up uh, when i didn't know him so well like, we worked together on on um on a film many years ago we didn't know me that well but he still called me up to just give me loads of advice on social media marketing and and whatnot and he gives a lot to other people so because he's that kind of person like you really root for him like I want nothing but success for that guy and I think it's just be that person be someone who um is kind and and gives to others and when the going gets tough and you want to get your project off the ground someone might do you a favor as well whether or not it's you know not everyone would want to go in as an actor but they might want to go in uh they might be brilliant at social media they might be brilliant at designing web pages they might be excellent at, at music or something you know and and people will pull together um but I think if you always kind and treat people with respect then eventually they'll come back and help you as well if if needs be yeah I can agree more it's all about relationships isn't it and just being a good person um I'd love to just talk a bit more on the horror film subject um you know stereotypically some actors might say that horror films aren't believable you know there's a ton of screaming and gore and things like that which I won't have I think Wrong Turn was a masterpiece Um, (laughs) have you seen that one we we actually watched I mean I'd seen it before but we watched that on the set of one of the films I worked on to get in the mood for our film but because I love love it as well and I love Eliza Dushku she's brilliant so isn't she I know yeah Yeah. well yeah we'll go back to the question I suppose what I was really trying to get, get at is how would you convince those actors that you know, the horror genre is great and it's not something that's to be looked down upon because, you know, there are great stories to be had in there and, and they can be naturalistic and real and emotional. I think it's going to be script specific, really. You know, you have to make that decision based on what you want out of the experience. Some actors want to go in and just do blood, gore, prosthetics and running around screaming because it's a lot of fun. Yeah, um, right. And I've done, you know, I've done a fair share of those, but with, with the ones that I've got more out of, um, that I've enjoyed more as a as an actor who loves to act um, is remembering that 
in order for people to get behind your character, whether it's a horror, a drama, a tragedy, whatever, you have to bring a real living, breathing character to life that people uh, care about. Um, whether you're the, the goody or the baddie or something, you know, sometimes in, in these kind of films, you can be a little bit of both. Um, so you can just you can just play it totally straight as a drama actor. That's what I try to do. I mean, obviously, there's some circumstances you're getting changed, chased by a guy with a chainsaw. You're going to scream. But um, but you want to believe that leading up to that point, you know, you might be believably um, a a daughter who's really upset with her parents because um, she can't afford to go to college. You know, there's all these little elements that can make her real and you can almost completely pull it away from the horror genre, play it that way. And then it's only when you watch the final cut that the horror kind of comes together all, all, all at once. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's not the be all and end all for me. As I say, I was first and foremost a, a theatre actor. Um, I've done a lot of kind of uh, just sort of straight laced kind of drama stuff, but it was just the horror horror uh, movies that kind of put you a little bit more on the grid because because they're cheaper to make because they may be slightly easier easier to market. There's a very dedicated fan base to horror films. The chances are you're going to make something that people do actually get to see, which is a really good a really good plus. And I have to say when. Um, when I found out that the Barge People, which is a film I shot in um, 2017, when I found out that was I'd got into Fright Fest, I was over the moon because that was on my bucket list for years. I love Fright Fest, and I, and, you know, some of my favourite movies screened there at premieres and stuff. And then to sit there in the audience and see one of mine showing was just like really awesome. Yeah. So you know, you can have these really proud, brilliant experiences, whether it's horror or not. Really, um, I'm not saying I am necessarily going to do many more horrors. Um, but I've not regretted a single one that I've worked on. Yeah. What initially got you into working on that genre? Because you, you're quite active talking about video games and social media as well. And I know that's <laughs> quite a big part of your um, your life is, you know, playing video games. Did that did that draw you into horror or was that just a coincidence that that's another hobby that you have? I, I think it's it's probably more of a coincidence than anything. I think, uh, again, it it'd probably be more of a character based um uh coincidence than a genre so what i mean by that is you know the, the characters that i love within the video game world um yeah sure they might be in stuff like resident evil tomb raider metal gear solid silent hill that kind of thing so they are they can tend to be more horror action um uh characters but they have those traits that i love as an actor you know i like strong women i like empowered women um i like things that involve explosions and guns and and a bit of gore not not as gratuitous as some people might think i don't particularly like gratuitous gore and i find it very hard to stomach since i've had a child i'll tell you that um but those uh those elements i suppose come through um from my love for video game characters and also it just transpires through to the film world as well so it is a coincidence but it's not really in terms of i'd certainly always push for those types of characters it was it's always interesting to hear when actors change their their process uh, behavior or mindset based upon experiences and obviously you've had a ton of experience in this industry across a range of projects mm -hmm. what have you learned from experience or direction or just generally watching others that's changed the way you work as an actor I think I personally think all actors go through phases um, and none of them are wrong but there are phases that, that we'll all go through where uh, you Every actor goes through a phase of feeling very insecure. Um, they don't know if they can do the job they really want to do, um, which can make marketing very difficult. It can make cutting your own show reel very difficult. It can make applying for agents very difficult. It's all those scary things that make us a bit anxious. So you'll go through that phase. Then there's the kind of hungry phase where you're like, I don't care what happens. I'm going to email a thousand casting directors today and I'm going to contact every single agent ever and off I go kind of thing. So that, again, is another phase and it's great. Then you'll have the kind of, um, I guess, the slightly more, uh, and actually, you know, let's go on that one first. There is the ego phase. There's definitely an ego phase. If you start to feel like you're doing okay, there's the ego phase where you, um, it, it, it comes through into your applications. You're like, I've worked on this, I've worked on that, now I want to work with you. And it's, again, it is a phase and it, it can sound really arrogant, but I do think a lot of actors go there. And then... The phase I'm in currently is the is the kind of laid back phase. And, and the ironic thing about the laid back phase is now is when things are getting a lot better. Um, but I think we all go through that that journey, really, of um, of of not knowing who we are as actors, but also not knowing what the hell we're doing in the industry. You know, we're just trying everything we think that everyone else is doing. 
and eventually it just kind of sits a bit nicer and it's a bit more comfortable. But I think that the, the laid back phase comes about more when you find things other than acting that you love a lot and your focus is always going to be on the love of the acting but it's not the be all and end all because I think sometimes that hunger can also destroy actors they can become um, obsessive and they forget to live their lives and and forget to appreciate what's right in front of them their friends and their family and their situations and stuff and it's difficult because we are all told to almost be kept um uh, in limbo all the time you know you can't book a holiday in case you book this casting or you know you can't I even had a uh, uh, an agent who was approaching me years ago who was <laughs> she'd found a casting for me and she was seriously telling me to maybe cancel my wedding day to attend this casting that she uh, found for me and I was like it's uh, my wedding day I don't think so <laughs> I, I yeah oh, that, you oh, know oh. <laughs> and um and and they'll turn around and be like I thought you were committed she wasn't even my agent she was an agent who thought she was doing me a favor but that mm. was that was a weird one um but uh yeah, I, I I don't even know where I'm going. I'm going into waffle mode. But I suppose what I'm trying to say is we go through all the different phases and we think we're different, but we're not. A lot of us are very much the same. I think because I recognise that, I think it's important to help others through some of those as much as I can, because I now have some experience that I want to to share, really. And I, I, I guess to to round up and actually offer some advice is keep being good and keep trying really hard with the things you want but don't stop enjoying everything else as well because every other experience you have in your life makes you a better actor because you've got stories to tell and you've got experiences and you've met people and and all that kind of stuff so yeah sorry probably went on a big tangent there I, I, I told you I can go into waffle no it, it, it was really there. interesting <laughs> and you're you're right that actors do go through phases and that there's a very there's a lot of similarities between people and we don't often see it because the projects or maybe the lack of projects that we um convert mm -hmm. into offers they're different but actually the journey yeah. is very very similar i mean christian and i yeah. at the moment are right knee deep in the unemployment phase aren't we christian that's what we're doing right yeah. now yeah i know <laughs> yeah it's, it's been tough though guys yeah it's been a hard hard couple of years Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, we 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 just you know you gotta have a bit of dark humor about it. Otherwise, you know what's the point? But um, I'd love to talk to you a bit about um generally social media. We'll get onto show or share day in a minute. But um, you're a great example of an actor that uses these platforms. And you mentioned uh, Mark Zamet as well. Things like Twitter and mm -hmm. Instagram to promote yourself, your work, network, and uh, generate opportunities. How important a part does social media play in your success as an actor? And how can actors and creatives use social media more proactively to benefit them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I would say that if you look at um, your typical actor page, so Spotlight, if you're on Spotlight, Monday, if you're on Monday, Star Now, if you're on Star Now, you often have quite a limited opportunity to show the person behind the actor that you're advertising. You know, you might have a headshot. If you're lucky, you might have 10 headshots, a showreel. Again, if you're lucky, not everyone has showreels. You know, it's difficult to get hold of that stuff sometimes. But the one thing that people really aren't able to see is um, your personality and whether or not you're good to work with. There are so many jobs, uh, in particular, again, independent film and theatre, where you're working all the hours under the sun with a bunch of people in some really uncomfortable, sometimes freezing cold situations. And you have to be someone that, that, that works well on these kind of sets. And I think that if you look at social media, uh, in contrast to that, you can have your banner photo, you can show a little bit more of yourself or you can show something you're interested in you know you mentioned my love for video games I often change my banner to something video game related um because people know straight away you know I never really actually told you guys I liked video games but you know that about me because you've probably seen it plastered all over my social media at some point um so you can give people a much bigger picture of who you are you can put your head shot up if you want or you can just put a really candid normal photo of you up you can post videos whenever you like you can give people a massive idea of what kind of person you're going to be before they even contemplate inviting you in for an audition and I think people really need to appreciate that is that so many people not just in the acting world but in the, the working world will suss out your social media to paint a little picture of you before they consider you for a casting 
I have also helped with a bit of casting and that's exactly one of the first things I do is I'll be like oh that person I think I remember their name from social media and I'll check my Twitter oh yeah I do and then I'll I can see a little bit more I can see their show roll pasted there or I can see you know I can see how they respond to people's tweets um and it just gives you it gives you an opportunity to just go look here I am this entire human being that really wants to work on your project I'm not just this little face on the spotlight page no disrespect to uh, spotlight because I really respect spotlight and um you know it's pretty much essential to be on there but social media just gives the actor a little bit of power back to just paint that bigger picture um and it definitely definitely helped for me within the independent film world without a doubt because if you've you know if you've made say your first connection like I mentioned before with Charlie you know I'd worked on a horror film at that point so then I set about following lots of people within the horror filmmaking world other actors, cast and directors, agents, and you have stuff to share and you can retweet, you can then unretweet it, retweet it again to bump it up and just stay on people's radar. And you're always going to wind some people up because you can't not wind people up on social media. It's just the nature of the beast. But <laughs> if you're lucky, your name will start to carry. And if you remember to be as respectful as you can, you know, it's difficult. Again, with social media, you might one day say something that other people don't like. If you can just do your best to come across as a, uh, uh, a sort of transparently true person, um, you know, without putting on too many airs and graces, but without upsetting anyone, then hopefully eventually that will work in the actor's favour. And I think, you know, it's it's just it just gives a little bit of power back, which is why um, I know you mentioned Cheryl Shirley, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment. But that was kind of what that was about. It's like. We don't want to sit there every day waiting to see if someone read our email. We want to keep showing you who we are and, and hope that at some point you notice us kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, you're, you're dead on. It's so crucial to just be the real organic you, as corny as that sounds. It's, it's all yeah. we've really got, isn't it? Um, yeah. I know we just touched upon uh, Showreel Share Day, um, which is such a fabulous idea. Uh, and I know there's no entry requirements or snobbery. It's just a really good opportunity for actors to showcase their work positively. And, and like you say, meet new people and build those relationships. Where did the, the idea initially come from? And how have you sort of grown and developed it since its first year? Or has that mainly been through sort of word of mouth? Okay, yeah, this one, uh, this one is, a, is a funny one to answer. And you'll, you'll figure that out at the end. But um. Uh, to, to begin with, it was a kind of happy accident. It actually started in 2015. And um, I had, uh, I'd always been really insecure about my show reels, like horrendously insecure. I, I, if I trusted a filmmaker friend enough, I'd ping them my, my show reel. It's like, you just look at it and just tell me if it's crap kind of thing. <laughs> um, anyway, after I'd worked on a couple of films that I was actually quite proud of, I would miraculously created a show reel that I could bear to watch. And um, I, I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to share it on my Twitter page and to see what my my friends think, thinking it would literally just be some of my friends that I knew pretty well, kind of thing. And um, and I did, but I included the hashtag Show Real Share Day because I thought, well, I'm a bit embarrassed to share my work, but if I ask my friends to join in, they might get on board, and then I won't feel like such an idiot. Um, so I did, and uh, some of my actress friends. Um, did the same they put the same hashtag in and uh long story short um a couple of hours later my friend sabrina <laughs> sent me a tweet saying i hope you realize this is trending number one in the uk and uh <laughs> where everyone had literally just jumped on it because you forget you just totally forget that there are we're all, a lot of again a lot of actors are sitting here and we have all our material we have our shows we have our head headshots we have our cvs we don't know what to do with them half the time because again we don't have that power um, but if we see an opportunity for something that we already have to just put it out there, you know, there's not many reasons to not join in. Um, it's the same with, you know, if, if it was filmmakers and you said, let's share a trailer, they probably all want to share their trailers because they want an excuse to promote it. They just don't want to be that person that's the first one to do it. So uh, it became a bit of a, um, it, it was a lot of fun, but it became like a bit of a beast then that I had to kind of tame because, People wanted it every day um, or we had to start putting rules into it because people were hijacking the hashtag. So basically using the hashtag show or share day and then putting all sorts of photos and stuff on because it was a trending event. Um, and so over the span of, I'm trying to think uh, how many times I've done it. 
But anyway, I've I've done it for at least five or six years, um, basically taking advice from a lot of really cool people in the industry because so many people jumped on board, just refined it down, you know, figured out how to edit that showreel, how to get it to play on 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 Twitter rather than send a link to another site, um, what to include in the tweet to get more traction, who to invite to watch the day. You know, I started emailing um, like United Agents, Curtis Brown, and the casting director and said, look, it's just one day. If you happen to be on social media, make yourself a cuppa and just watch some showreels. And when some of the bigger players did get involved, um, that's when it really started to take off. And I would say we've had some brilliant ones. We've had some not not so brilliant ones. Um, but overall, it has been, it, it's always just absolutely blown my mind when we've done one, um, how, how far it's gone, really. And, I, you know, I even had friends tweeting me from like Australia and America saying it started to trend there once we were like going to bed it's like oh by the way we've all caught into a hashtag and it's trending over here now kind of thing um but it, again it's because people like they really I think needed that sense of um community to make them feel like they weren't just this little solo actor banging their head against a brick wall waiting for the next opportunity to come up it was like oh it's a chance to like show you some of what I've done so far and also meet people that I've never met before. And also I saw people, because I was tagged in a lot of people's tweets, I saw people reconnect. Like, they were like, oh, we worked in a theater together like t 10 years ago. Nice to see you. Like they all found each other again via Twitter that day. And it was really cool. Um, so yeah, I, so I've, I've, I've loved it. Um, where I'm going with this when I said it was a weird one is uh, I made a decision this year after um, after talking with my new agent who I signed with back in, I think it would have been around March. Um, and, and, and you know, because life and I've, I've had this sort of insight that I am not actually going to be doing any more show or share events myself. However, because people enjoy it, I am considering, I, I'm, I'm constantly looking out for how to play my cards next. And basically I want to, pass it over to somebody else to do with what they want to as long as I guess they keep on board some of the some of the rules that make it work well and put their own spin on it so I've a few people in mind but my my share or share days are pretty much over with oh well it's, re it's really nice that you still ha like you're keeping a little bit of creative control when, when you hand that over and um, I'm really looking forward to see whoever you choose as your successor with that event and how they take it and adapt it some more. Because as we've spoken about quite a lot in this podcast, it's personalities are what make this make you uh, successful in this industry is embracing, embracing and using your um, personality. And as you say, that first time of doing it trended number one in the UK and it's always a huge day on Twitter. Um, from watching and sharing an unbelievable amount of showreels in that time, what would be your number one tip? If you could only give actors one tip on making a fantastic reel, what would it be? I would say um, if it was just one tip, I'd say short and sweet, like really cut it down. The shorter, the better. I mean, having, again, you know, helped in some casting, I... I'd be, I, you know, I'd be lying if I said you really watched more than 20 seconds of someone's showreel, mm -hmm. but they have to be brilliant 20 seconds at the start. You know, put your best scene first, definitely, and keep it nice and, and snappy and short. And it's not always something you can do yourself because we fall in love with our own work eventually. And um, it's very hard to cut out what we think is our best scene, but you just need to get someone else with a creative eye to look at it. And very often they know almost instantly at the exact point you need to cut that scene. So go with it even if you don't want to but keep it short snappy and cut it at the exact point where people want to know more but you're not going to give it to them mm -hmm. okay you've give us, given us some fantastic tips today and shared a lot of knowledge with us so now it's time to boast we'd <laughs> love to know anything you can tell us about projects you're currently working on or will be in the future that people can see you in Thank you. Um, I've got two things to talk about. One uh, is a project that I actually worked on this year. So my most recent project is a short film called Choose Your Weapon. It's by my friend Gabriela Staniszewska and uh, she's teamed up with Dream More Films, um, JD Dovefield. And um, the reason I loved working on that was uh, not only have I known Gabriella since we were at Playgroup <laughs> and uh, she went into production and I went into acting. So it was great that we collaborated as adults. But the, the nature of her film was so um, 
on the nose for me because uh, it, it it's although it's an action film, it's called Choose Your Weapon. It's got these brilliant stunt people involved. It's actually about um, postnatal depression and anxiety that a lot of mothers have that are afraid to talk about or even think that they're experiencing. And this film, uh, Gabriella spoke to me a lot about it when she was coming up with the idea. But having been involved in it and now watched it back, she's completely nailed everything that, uh, again, a lot of mothers experience and fail to articulate uh, in a really fun, snappy little short film. And I think it's going to do incredibly well once people get to see it. Um, the reviews of the people that have seen it so far have been brilliant so i'm very proud of that one so if people could just look out for choose your weapon that would be amazing um and if gabriella happens to listen to this i'm incredibly incredibly proud of you my uh my final kind of sign off on on projects really is that um uh after after hammering away for 20 years in the industry um i finally just landed my first tv role um congratulations it, thank you and I can't, you know, I said to you, I'm going to be a bit elusive. I can't say what it is yet because I haven't had it officially announced uh, by my agent. But I'm just so overjoyed. I, I've, And again, it's that feeling of like, I feel like it just arrived now. But I feel like it's 20 years in the making of, of pushing really hard for something. And then suddenly stuff just clicked and I'm really excited. So oh. I've got something to look forward to next year. And it's given me a massive uh, motivation to... To, to be better at everything I talk about. I want to become someone who is a good actor. So that's something I'm very excited about. Amazing news. Thank Fantastic. You. Lovely. Now, we've asked all our detailed, specific questions. We will be moving on to the rapid fire section. It's a bit like a game <laughs> show, this bit. I think I was a bit like the host out of Gladiator in one of our previous recordings. So I'm not going to go for sort of full on 90s cringe, but we'll just we'll just dive in. So we've prepped 10 questions for you. You haven't been sent these in advance. Some are actor related, some are completely idiotic, and we'd love you to try and answer them in one sentence or less. Kate, speak. Are you ready for some in the room rapid fire questions? Bring it on. Let's do it. Do you want to start off, Christian? I'll go first. What is your spirit animal? A cat. If you had to share something other than showreels, what would it be? Fitness advice. What would you be if you weren't an actor? A video game character designer. What's the first film someone should watch if they want to get into the horror genre? The Descent. Favourite snack while watching a film? Prosecco. <laughs> <laughs> we asked someone to describe your work as an actor in one word. What would you want that one word to be? Intriguing. You can only play one video game for the rest of your life. What do you choose? Resident Evil 2. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Flying. What scares you? Uh, vulnerability. And finally, you get cast as the new Lara Croft tomorrow, but you can't ever do another film. Would you take it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a stupid oh, yeah. question when I wrote it down, but <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on this evening and talking to us, Kate. Thank We've covered a myriad me. of topics. You've given some brilliant advice and entertainment. And thank you for humoring our stupid questions at the end. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us in the room. And we'll let you go have a lovely rest of your day. Right back at you guys. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me on.